We have a very exciting discussion today, but uh, let me just uh, welcome everybody and uh, say that I'm Professor uh, Tom Arachowishkin at Georgia State University Cyber. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cybers, they are centers for international education, business and research, uh, partially funded by the US federal government, Department of Education, and partially by the respective universities. We are coming to you as a consortium of uh, 10 cybers, 10 national resource centers in international business uh, located across the nation. And uh, Georgia State Cyber coordinates this uh, consortium and this effort uh, of uh, ongoing webinars. In fact, it's been uh, exactly one year uh, since we started our international business webinar series with our partners and we ran something like 45 different webinars on trade issues, international trade, international business uh, pedagogy, teaching topics, and we've also held conversations with business leaders uh, and, and they have been very popular. We appreciate your continued interest. If this is your first time attending a cyber webinar, please come back because we, we have a very full agenda going into several months on various topics that will be of interest to you. So these sessions are recorded. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, view them later on uh, and you'll receive an email afterwards with a link to the recording. When you exit uh, the webinar in just about an hour, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll have the opportunity to respond to a brief survey. Please do that. Just a few questions so that we can learn about your interest areas and your reactions to this uh, particular event as well as the webinar series. Everyone in the uh, webinar today, except the MAP panelists, uh, is muted. Uh, so but you'll have the opportunity to put your questions and comments in the Q&A uh, icon. Uh, just use that feature. And if you need any assistance, uh, please use the chat uh, icon, chat uh, feature. Uh, we'll, have about, we'll have a very interesting discussion today with two very distinguished speakers on a very interesting topic, but we'll leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end uh, for some comments and questions and final thoughts. And by the way, the, the two speakers we have today are using uh, a brief number, a modest number of slides, and those slides will be available to everyone who participated uh, today. Uh, you'll get an email about with the att attachments as well. So today's topic is sports diplomacy. It's obviously not something that we discuss on a daily basis. And uh, frankly, most of us probably don't know what it is and what the federal government does in this uh, arena. Uh, so that will be uh, the topic of uh, Trina Bolton. We'll start with her and, and, and we'll ask her a few questions. What is after all sports diplomacy? Uh, does it involve all kinds of sports? Uh, are there certain countries or regions of the world that are maybe priorities. How do we coordinate sports diplomacy efforts along with many other uh, efforts uh, where we try to enhance our state-to-state uh, -state relationships and cross-cultural relationships? And, and Trina, I know uh, you've also been involved with this empowering women and girls that I'd like to hear about that program as well. But a very brief discussion, a very brief introduction to Trina I'd like to offer. Trina, of course, is the, uh, as you read in her bio, she is the program officer in sports diplomacy at the Education and Cultural Affairs of the US Department of State, where she's been serving for some time. Uh, I think, Trina, your interest in uh, sports uh, was sparked by the 1996. You were not born then, but uh, uh, you certainly uh, recall the importance of that event on Atlanta, on the region, and the rest of the nation as well. And since then, uh, you've been very active in sports and sports diplomacy. You co-authored the book, 
And I know you have also your education reflects your interest with a bachelor's degree from George Washington University in international affairs and also a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon on public policy and management. So we'll come back uh, in just a second uh, and ask you to get us started, Trina. And welcome and thank you for being here, Trina. I'd like to ask, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce my good colleague, Professor Leanne Lu, who's joining us today uh, from Helsinki, where she is serving as the Fulbright Scholar, uh, Hanken uh, Fulbright Scholar to uh, uh, Hanken School of Business uh, in, in Finland. And uh, I'm gonna ask Leanne uh, to introduce uh, our second speaker, Bruce Taylor, uh, briefly also. Leanne? Thank you, Tamir. Uh, Mr. Bruce Taylor retired from IBM after 32 years in the US, UK, Japan, Australia. He was involved in various ways in the Olympics in Barcelona, Lillehammer, uh, Nagano, Atlanta, and Sydney. At the Atlanta Olympics, his primary responsibility was the competition results system and he's especially knowledgeable about technology use um, at the Olympic Games. So we're looking forward to hearing your insights from Bruce. Um, thank you, Bruce, for being here. And, um, and, yeah, and good morning to you, Bruce, and thank you for being here as well. So Trina, uh, lots of questions, uh, but maybe you start with the fundamental one. What is sports diplomacy after all? Oh, well, thank you. So, so good morning and good afternoon to everyone, wherever you may be. I know this is a global group, but um, off the bat, I, I do want to thank you, Dr. Kavaskill and Ms. Huntley, Leanne, Rebecca, and the Georgia State University community for welcoming me to this cyber event. It's an honor to present with Bruce Taylor, and I appreciate this golden opportunity to share a bit more on sports diplomacy. But I was thinking earlier this morning um, about a trip that I made to Turkey in 2011 with Georgia State University journalism students through the cyber program. And so I had a chance to join um, this group through Dr. Kaviskill and Global Atlantis, an international news firm founded by my dad, Philip Bolton, and headed up by Trevor Williams now. So there's a plug. But um, after all of these years, my most memorable experience in and memory is, is from when Istanbul's uh, soccer team, Fenerbahce, uh, beat their big rival uh, while we were there. And Taksim Square was the celebratory place, which is in contrast to more recent, um, more recently. And, and the city celebration was a highlight for the group. We had no dog in that fight, but we were so into it. And, and I thought it really speaks to the power of sports and cultural experiences. So I wanted to share that. And, and definitely the 1996 Olympics and Paralympics. I was a kid, but it really was a game changer in, in my life. Uh, it showed the power of sports to me. So with that, I'm here today to discuss uh, the US Department of State's use of sports to promote foreign policy. So I'll walk through our key sports diplomacy programs and then look forward to Bruce Taylor's insights. And then of course, um, Q&A but I have a basic slide deck that I'm going to share. Here we go. Let's see. Yep, it's coming on. So, so to get started, just off the bat, what is sports diplomacy? Um, and how does the US government use it? So broadly, sports diplomacy emerges as a soft power tool um, leveraged by different countries um, in their efforts to build ties with others while pushing on their policies and interests. So I will clarify um, for the purposes of this presentation that I'm going to describe the US Department of State's use of sports to build bridges between Americans and people around the world. Um, so this is a State Department focus, um, but uh, countries are using sports diplomacy uh, across the board in a variety of ways. Um, our sports diplomacy division is a, a small office, small but mighty. We're housed within the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. So the US Department of State is not just focused on government to government relations. Through our bureau, we're all about people to people ties. It, 
more the grassroots level. So um, our, our bureau does uh, runs a lot of academic, um, uh, cultural and sports exchanges to build bridges between Americans and people all around the world. So um, through the shared passion of sports, interest in sports and activities and enterprise related to sports, the US Department of State is able to reach a new demographic that otherwise may not be tuned in on what a bureaucrat or a US embassy representative is saying. Uh, so uh, we, we reach out at this grassroots level to promote our democratic foreign policy priorities and to get to a new audience. So you all are academics. Um, you may well be aware of uh, um, sports diplomacy, the historical use of sports um, by the US government uh, to promote our, uh, our foreign policy agenda, um, going back to the Cold War uh, and also ping pong diplomacy. So same idea, same shop, um, but our sports diplomacy division is relatively young. So we're about 20 years old. We were established after September 11th primarily as a means of reaching out to Muslim youth through soccer, so more of a national security preventing violent extremism angle, also to dispel negative sentiments of Americans. But we've since expanded to include all regions. We work with our uh, colleagues in the regional bureaus at the US Department of State to be strategic about the countries we're working in each year. Um, and we've included thousands of individuals, the whole spectrum of sports. I always tell people we've done everything from blind gold ball in Brazil to flying disc golf in Russia. To us, it's not really the sport. Sport is the hook. Um, and, and, and it's a way for us to promote our foreign policy priorities. If we're strategic when we design these, um, we, uh, we can effectively promote gender equality, social justice, inclusion, respect for the environment, mental health, physical wellness, you name it, sports is our in. So a bit more, um, our office works with the public affairs and cultural affairs officers at the US embassies and consulates all around the world um, to run these programs. So we're, all, we're tapping into this passion for sports and um, all of our exchanges are about mutual understanding. It's a two way street. We're not just exporting American sports um, it's really a way for us to level the playing field um, and, and reach out to marginalized communities, open doors in hard to reach places is what we say. So we describe ourselves as having four key pillars. And I say we have a lot of side hustles in addition to that. So we maybe need to add a pillar, but I'll walk through these four key pillars. Uh, the first one is our sports envoy program. And we work with the, um, the US embassies and consulates to run these exchanges as well as um, the US leagues and federations. Um, I mean, the, um, the international um, leagues and federations, but primarily the US based leagues and federations and the US Olympic and Paralympic committees. So we identify um, current, former professional athletes, Olympians, Paralympians to go overseas and act as the ambassadors of goodwill on behalf of the US government. So they run clinics, they make motivational talks, and they, um, they also have uh, ambassadorial and ministerial level meetings. Um, they serve pro bono. It's not about a photo splash. It's not a one-off. It builds into our US embassy's integrated uh, strategic um, planning on the ground. And, um, and, and I will say we have had some big names like Shaquille O'Neal and Katie Ledecky, Alex Morgan, there's Jackie Joyner Kersey, that was one of my favorite programs. Um, but it's really, it's, it's more about role models. And so we work with the leagues and federations in the US to identify these role models. They kind of vet the athletes for us because we don't have a ministry of sport and I can get into that later. So that is our, our, our first pillar. So at any given moment, we would have athletes all around the world. Right now we are doing um, virtual envoy programming. So I'll also say we, um, we do targets of opportunity with athletes. So if there's American athletes who are traveling overseas for competitions or even just to go visit maybe a relative or go on vacation and they're interested in supporting our sports diplomacy initiatives, we'll team up with our US embassies on the ground to, to have an economical and effective, efficient program. So um, the Harlem Globetrotters, they're based in Atlanta. They really live up to their, their name. They're always... Um, 
in every corner of the world. So sometimes we can sync up that travel. Um, there's a, a picture of Sergi Baca. He goes home, he's an NBA basketballer and he goes home to Congo. And um, our embassies worked with, um, with his foundation on the ground. And this is just a photo from the um, uh, Asian Skateboarding Championships. And we did some programming uh, while all of the athletes were in country. So on the flip side, to keep a thread of continuity in the countries and regions in which we're working, if we do an envoy program, an outbound program, we do want to do an inbound program that brings international visitors to the U.S. Um, so this is our sports visitor track. We work with the, um, the U.S. embassies and consulates to recruit um, uh, youth sports administrators and coaches to come to the U.S. for a short-term program. There's one sport, but there's always a foreign policy theme. Um, they, uh, they don't need to be superstar athletes. We're not about recruiting um, the next big baller. It's um, really about identifying change agents in the community. It's beautiful in that they don't need to speak English. We have interpreters and really sports is this universal language. Uh, and, and it allows for us to, um, to build ties uh, with, with um, young people all around the world. And I will say, um, uh, we had a group from Niger and Cote d'Ivoire several years ago that went to Atlanta. And so they went to the Carter Center and they um, met with Ambassador Andrew Young. Um, and they also played with soccer in the streets uh, kids. And I think they still stay in touch. So that's just one example of many, our sports, sports visitor program. So the International Sports Programming Initiative is our third pillar. And that's on an annual basis, certified American 501c3s are eligible to submit applications to receive funding from our office to conduct their own two-way people-to-people exchanges using sport for social changes is the key theme. And, and so we are not as intimately involved in these programs as we would be with the other two. We definitely involve the public affairs sections in the embassies and the regional Bureau officers at the State Department in crafting these programs, but really it's it's kind of a way to contract out a little bit more, expand our network, and really leverage the expertise of our um, of American organizations involved in sport for social change. So um, I I also learned uh, that Georgia State University was one of the first grant recipients back in the day from our office. Um, and it was for adaptive sports programming. And I think it then evolved into a program headed up by Kennesaw State and then became a uh, Blaze Sports NGO, which is based in Atlanta. And, and Blaze is the, uh, the Paralympic mascot from 96. So that's just a fun factoid related to Atlanta. So our fourth program is the Global Sports Mentoring Program. And it's our professional development exchange. It uh, grew out of our Empowering Women and Girls Through Sports Initiative, which is our umbrella uh, uh, program. Um, and I always say it's a, quite a self-explanatory title, but um, we have programs under this overarching umbrella that, that largely parallel what I just described, but a female focus. And we spread the global lessons of Title IX, equality and opportunity for women and girls in academics and sports. So, um, Within this program, we developed a public-private partnership with ESPNW. It's our global sports mentoring program to empower women. It's almost a decade old, and we've worked with the University of Tennessee's Center for Sport, Peace, and Society from the get-go. They're experts in the realm of gender equality in sports. So this program is a true public-private partnership, ESPNW, ESPN Women. Um, secures a roster of senior female executives in the sports sector here in the U.S. And through the U.S. embassies and consulates, we recruit um, really heavy hitters in the world of women's sports from around the world to come to the U.S. for a five-week mentorship. The University of Tennessee um, uh, organizes and um, orchestrates the programming on the ground. And, and so we're in our 10th year, we have over 130 sportswomen who have come through this program. We had a woman, a sports journalist from Uganda uh, who was matched up with Coca-Cola in Atlanta several years ago, but I think that's been the only uh, Atlanta-based site thus far, um, but we're always open to recruiting uh, mentors. And, and so this program is really about 
long-term sustainable change. So the delegates, while they're here, they focus on an action plan that they'll put into play when they go back home to change the world, to empower the next generation of, uh, of girls through sports. And, and um, we could go uh, on and on about um, the, the sports women and what they're doing, um, but uh, our, our partners at the University of Tennessee are sure to stay in touch with them and support them and to track their progress and also support them in, in their challenges when they go back home. So using this model, we created a cousin program, Sport for Community. Um, and that is a program focused on disability rights for men and women from all around the world. The University of Tennessee is our cooperative partner on this program too. And uh, it's individuals in the Paralympics, Deaf Olympics and Special Olympics spaces come to the US for a five week mentorship focused on spreading the global lessons of the Americans with Disabilities Act and really um, providing opportunities for underserved communities in sports, not just participation, but also at the leadership level. So, um, so that's our fourth pillar. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, salute my colleagues out in the field, uh, the, the public affairs and cultural affairs officers that are running their own embassy led uh, sports programs. Um, is just a few examples. Our office may be involved, but we may not be funding it. Um, and, and often we learn about the use of sports by, um, by embassies and consulates around the world after the fact, but all in the family. So just as an example, that's Meb Kobleski. He is a, a, a famous marathoner and um, he's one of my heroes. I ran cross country, but he um, uh, originally came to the States as a refugee from Eritrea. So he's done, he's gone back to see family and he's worked with the US Embassy in, in Asmara several times to do outreach programming. And this is just an example. Um, our embassy in Tajikistan has a partnership uh, with the Tajik Olympic Committee on um, anti-drug uh, trafficking and women's empowerment. Um, uh, what we worked with One World Project Play, which is a, a um, organization that creates durable, ultra durable soccer balls. And um, our embassies uh, often team up with this organization to distribute soccer balls in conjunction with sports programming. And this is a picture of um, girls participating in Skatistan, which is an educational and skateboarding program in Afghanistan that our public affairs section in Kabul has supported over the years. Just a few examples of what my colleagues out in the field are doing in the way of sports. So um, it's it's not about a one-off. It's very important for us to to stay in touch, to um, to monitor how um, the alumni, any delegates who go through uh, our programs, American or international, we consider them alumni, like they've gone to State Department University to a certain degree, um, Fulbright alumni, uh, our same family, and so through our embassies, we stay in touch with um, former participants, alumni. And, and, and through our cooperative grant partners and grants, we have follow-on opportunities. We have um, all sorts of virtual activities to stay in touch with them. And then also we, we orchestrate reunions overseas and in the United States to gauge the process, progress of um, plans um, and, and also to, to learn um, from, from challenges and pitfalls as we continually improve and uh, and um, refine our, our strategies. So this is a, um, just an example of the importance of monitoring and evaluation. Our partners at UT, they, um, they do a lot of surveying. I mean, even nine year out survey, surveying, which is, um, which is to me quite impressive. Um, and, and so just showing what indicators we're tracking in terms of, of long-term change. And, and I think our factoids have even gone up um, through the Global Sports Mentoring Program. Our alumni have impacted over 310,000 individuals directly through their sports action plans in, um, in all corners of the world, almost 100 countries. We're going for more. So I also wanted to highlight that we, um, we didn't miss a beat with our programming in terms of uh, COVID's impact. Uh, and so we, we shifted to, to virtual programming like everyone. And, and I will say the sports and fitness industry really exploded with, with its virtual activity activities. But we work with our US embassies on a series of programs um, that, that tapped into technology to stay in touch with our alumni, to promote, let's say the Americans with Disabilities Act had its 30th birthday last summer. We did a lot around it. 
Our alumni had a fitness challenge. Um, we really drum up the UN International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, which happens to be April 6th, so it's on the near horizon. Um, and we did uh, activities around social justice, racial justice um, uh, in, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, uh, murder. And, um, and we did a series called Get Fit, which was with some of our sports envoys. Uh, we really did workouts with them, but it was more about their experiences as envoys around the world and the power of sports in, in change, individual and global change. Um, and our cooperative partners actually did a really special series um, on using uh, recycled products to make adaptive sports equipment. And it was something that individuals could do safely at home and um, it was affordable. So sharing the story is very important to us too. Um, whether or not individuals can be a part of our office's work, um, since we are a small shop with a limited budget, um, we want to inspire others. We wanna share the story uh, of what we're doing and what our alumni are doing. And it's actually um, our alumni and the actual participants in our programs, they're sometimes the strongest voices. Uh, the, the sports diplomacy experience through their lens is, is all the more powerful in terms of sharing with, with the community. So we have podcasts and we have social media, websites and traditional media. Um, and in events like this, we always love spreading the word. So thank you for, for helping us do that. So this last little bit speaks to the United States and how we are unique and that we don't have a ministry of sport. So um, it's part of the reason we're a powerhouse to a certain degree because we have intramurals and grassroots NCAA uh, sports programs and all of the leagues and federations. But um, on the international stage, as it relates to, to policy, what is the US statement on access to sport as a human right? What is the US statement on the hijab in sports? Uh, so we have a patchwork approach and that we work with um, other bureaus within the US Department of State um, kind of to craft the, the statement. And of course, the White House um, and the, the, the President's Council on Fitness, Sport and Nutrition, we used to work with um, in terms of developing kind of our domestic strategy. But um, internationally, uh, we've worked closely with the Bureau of International Organizations at the State Department and the UN um, and the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor on the dark side of sports, which is more about mega sporting events and human rights violations. But here are just a few items. Is to, is to, um, here's just a few examples of policy related topics that we get involved in um, as it relates to uh, sports diplomacy on the global stage. Um, so mega sporting events um, is also a, an area where we're quite involved in terms of policy, but also targets of opportunity, public diplomacy, sports programming around it, but also but also policy. Um, and so the Summer and Winter Olympics and Paralympics, um, the World Cup, Women's World Cup, Men's World Cup. I think if we say the Women's World Cup, we should say Men's World Cup for consistency. Um, I have my preferred Women's World Cup, but in um, the Pan Am and Parapan games. Um, but I mean, we're thinking of, you know, Tokyo is coming up and that's been a very complex and challenging um, summer games to address. And then Beijing, um, all the same. So mega sporting events and um, and in policy uh, definitely come into play. Uh, and with the, that, um, on mega sporting events, I think we can seg to um, Mr. Bruce Taylor. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Trina. It's fascinating. It's very educational. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I cannot help mention, but you know, you may be a small group in the U.S. Department of State, but your impact is felt and it's very robust, very powerful. I think what gives it real power is this citizen to citizen contact that you facilitate, you create between nations and cultures. I think uh, as opposed to let's say diplomats, uh, diplomat to diplomat interaction. I, I think you get your power from that. And you did mention that many other countries do have a ministry of sports and we are one of the few perhaps that do not have uh, that. So you kind of fill that void, I think, in, in our uh, federal government uh, space. So uh, we, have, we have a lot of comments and questions, but uh, we'll save those until uh, we hear from our second very distinguished speaker, 
Bruce Taylor. Well, thank you very much. I wanted to thank Leanne also for inviting me to participate and for convincing Dr. Cavazgill that it was appropriate for me to do so. Uh, as Leanne said, I had some involvement in five Olympics starting in Barcelona in 92. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that involvement was. Uh, but I also, as Leanne knows, could talk for over an hour about various aspects of my Olympic experience, but I promised not to do that in the interest of everybody's lunch and, and the, the schedule. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about a couple of examples where I think before the uh, sports diplomacy department was actually established in state, a couple of examples where sports diplomacy on the global stage actually played a role. Uh, my team actually developed the software for the Atlanta 1996 results systems. And I also had a team working in Lillehammer in 94 for the Olympics in, uh, in Norway, partially to, to learn about sports, learn about the technology of sports. So the games in Lillehammer uh, were actually staged in the small town of 23,000 people. Um, which was at that time the northernmost, in fact, it still is the northernmost host city ever to host the Olympics. So the games were actually held closer to the Arctic Circle than ever before, uh, about 110 miles north of Oslo. They were also the first winter games after the summer winter games were separated by the IOC. A little fun fact, did you know that figure skating and ice hockey actually debuted in the Summer Olympics in 1908 and 1920, which was before the first Winter Games that were held in Chamonix, France in 1924. Uh, after those first Winter Games in Chamonix, the Winter and Summer Games were always held in the same year until 1994, when they were changed to alternating even numbered years. So now there's a separation of two years between the fun of the winter and the fun of the summer games, rather than waiting four years with no Olympics to watch on television, which I think was undoubtedly one of the drivers of the motivation to actually split them. Sports Illustrated, after the games in 94, wrote an article uh, that praised the Lillehammer games for their perfection. Perfect weather, perfect sports events, perfect organizing, and it was truly a, a terrific games. They described them as the fairy tale, day, fairy tale games. They could not exist. Reality cannot be this good. So I was there both before, after, and during the games in 94. And I can tell you that the Sports Illustrated article did not exaggerate. They were truly perfect games. Despite the perfection, they were also held under a dark cloud because they were actually staged during the Bosnian War. As some of you may know, the Sarajevo games were held 10 years before that in February, 1984. And within eight years, the siege of Sarajevo had begun and it was ongoing during the games and unfortunately lasted two years after the Lillehammer games. So the Lillehammer games were the first modern games played under the terms of the Olympic truce, which was a tradition that actually began in the ancient Greek games in eighth century BC. They called for laying down arms during the games. This ensured that both spectators and participants in the ancient games could travel to Olympia, enjoy the participation in the games, and travel home before encountering any uh, warlike actions. This tradition did not continue when the modern games began in 1896, but they were revived. The, the Olympic truce was revived by UN resolution in October 93, a couple of months before the games in Lillehammer. <clears throat> and it also meant that warring nations and warring factions during the Sarajevo siege were allowed to participate. The opening ceremony included reminders of the ongoing siege of Sarajevo. 
the IOC president in his speech opening the games asked all the participants, all the spectators to stand in a moment of uh, recollection or remembrance of Sarajevo. And he then implored the warring factions, please stop the fighting, please stop the killing, lay down your arms. And it was a very moving uh, ceremony. The Bosnia-Herzegovina four-man bobsled team was actually comprised of three different members of the warring factions from that siege of Sarajevo. One Croatian, two Bosnians, and one Serbian athlete. The closing ceremony also featured <clears throat> remembrance of Sarajevo, including a uh, candle ceremony, candle where 40,000 spectators were all given mini mag light uh, flashlights on their way into the stadium inscribed with Remember Sarajevo. So it too was a very moving tribute. So with the perfection of the games as staged in Lillehammer in, in every way, and the fact that it was held under the cloud of the Bosnian war that was ongoing, it really represented an example of sports diplomacy and Olympic spirit at the worst of times. Uh, the next games that I participated in, my team actually built the software, as I mentioned, for the Olympic results system in Atlanta. At the time, and still, it was the largest event in the city's history. And it was the largest Olympics at the time, measured in number of national Olympic committees, athletes, and sporting events that actually took place during the games. One of the systems that we developed for Atlanta was the commentator information system that was used by on-air TV broadcasters to make them sound smart about the, the pageantry of the ceremonies and the sports events themselves and the ongoing medal competitions. So this system, which this is actually a screenshot of the touchscreen system that was used and it did include, as I say, information about the pageantry of the games. However, at every Olympics, there is always a lot of secrecy associated with the identity of the four athletes who will bring the flame to the stadium and light the Olympic cauldron. And Atlanta was no different. So although the commentator system did have information about the pageantry and the dance and the the elements of the opening ceremony, it did not have the information about the four athletes who would bring the torch to the stadium and to light the torch. Uh, there was a lot of speculation in Atlanta about Evander Holyfield being the one who would end up lighting the cauldron. He's a local hero. He was at the time favored by the organizing committee. But nobody knew, including NBC's Bob Costas. Nobody knew until the very last moment. So a few moments before the flame arrived in the stadium, <clears throat> I was given the information to be entered into the system, identifying the four athletes who were going to bring the, state, bring the torch to the stadium and light the cauldron. So you can probably imagine my thrill when I realized that the cauldron would be lit by Muhammad Ali, having the last step in the chain was Janet Evans, the Olympic swimmer, handed the flame to Muhammad Ali to light the torch. The 1960 Olympic light heavyweight boxing gold medal winner. Centennial Olympic Games of Atlanta. So it was truly a very dramatic and emotional um, torch lighting, cauldron lighting, as they often are. Uh, in this case, the chairman of NBC Sports, Dick Ebersol, had been lobbying for months 
that Muhammad Ali should light the cauldron. Uh, the organizing committee, as I mentioned, had been favoring the local hero, Vander Holyfield. But after a couple of months of lobbying by uh, Vic Ebersol, uh, the organizing committee agreed. And in the words of Billy Payne, Dick, I get it. It has to be Ali. And Dick Ebersol's primary motivation or one of his main motivations was that while Evander Holyfield was a local hero, Muhammad Ali was a global hero. And he was, to Muslims around the world, he was a fellow traveler and truly a hero. So I think it was a good example of Dick Ebersol having the global diplomacy perspective and that influenced the games. And by the way, I've read that it actually helped Muhammad Ali. His, his widow, after he passed away, apparently wrote that before this selection to light the cauldron, he had been kind of slipping and he was very nervous and uh, embarrassed about appearing in public with his Parkinson's that was very advanced. But his disappearance really turned him around so that for the last years of his life, he had a much more positive uh, perspective than he had before. And Evander Holyfield, who had been the local uh, favorite, also was quoted after the games as saying that the organizing committee had chosen the right man. It had to be Ali. So those are my comments and I'll be happy to take any questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Very informative as well. Very interesting facts. And I cannot help think about the, you know, the role of Atlanta and global uh, affairs and sports diplomacy. Uh, and I do want to mention, obviously, uh, that year was a special year in the internationalization of the city and the region and the Southeast, as well as the impact of the uh, International Airport, Hartsfield uh, International Airport. I think those were two remarkable milestones. And I cannot help mention, but also the importance of Global Atlanta. And thank you, Trina, for mentioning that, because I always felt that uh, Global Atlanta the news portal that your father started, our good friend and supporter uh, Phil Walton, is a gift to the region. And it's, it's really our connection to the rest of the world. So many different uh, questions here, so many interesting questions, but uh, maybe I'll just start with, uh, with something that uh, relates to uh, professions. If somebody wants to, some young person, young professional wants to get involved, in global diplomacy, Trina. I mean, how do we get involved? Not necessarily just uh, through your office, but through local efforts. That's a great question. So when I first started in this office, almost a decade ago, um, sports diplomacy um, was, was quite niche. And, um, and, and since then, really the sport for social change and sport for development, um, sports for business kind of uh, realm has 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 grown. It's a burgeoning field um, in academia in practice. So um, lots of universities have sports and philanthropy programs, sports management, international affairs, sports diplomacy. Uh, so there's so there's this academic track that's going on, um, and, and it relates directly to the work that we're doing. Um, and then in terms of practitioner work, there's there's lots of NGOs that are using sports to promote. Um, global affairs, global connectivity. Um, and that's, we support these NGOs that are both American-based and international. So that's another track where someone could get involved through an NGO, through a university, um, and, uh, and, and seek ways to use sports to promote their own projects, programs, initiatives, because sports is something that, that is, um, that can be used across the board in a variety of ways. And, and so I think involvement um, in academia and, and with the NGOs that are actively using sports, both at the um, local and global levels is, is really a way forward. I mean, in Atlanta, there's, there's so many organizations that are engaging the community youth in the city um, and, and they serve as great models for other, other cities around the world. Um, and I also know that the mayor's office actually has stood up its own international sports diplomacy division or, um, or initiative 
that, um, that's tied to really this legacy of the 96 games too. So there's, there's all sorts of support for social change activity taking place. Our office is tiny, but um, within the US Department of State, um, we work with, with all sorts of partners and we couldn't do it without the athletes, without the activists, um, and without the practitioners and academics who work in this field. Excellent. And thank you so much, uh, Trina, for also mentioning CSPPS, the University of Tennessee Center for Sport, Peace, and Society. They're here with us today, and they're offering a lot of praise uh, for your partnership on the Global Sports Mentoring Program. What a what an incredible uh, center and activity. We appreciate their effort as well. Uh, Bruce and Trina, you may respond to this question, uh, actually several of them. Uh, the relationship between uh, sports and uh, international policy, foreign policy. Uh, so the examples that are given actually both at the local level and international level. At the local level, uh, level here in Atlanta, perhaps the Georgia legislature's uh, efforts to uh, change voting uh, procedures and the local sports teams reacting to that. Uh, in fact, many companies, many world-class companies based in Atlanta reacting to that, as well as uh, the uh, you know, boycotting of Olympics uh, because the Chinese, or at least leaving out the Chinese out of the 2022 Olympics because of their treatment of the uh, Uyghurs and, and the Hong Kong democracy advocates. Uh, so they are mixed. I mean, invariably they're mixed. I guess at the State Department, I'll start with you, Trina, and then we'll turn to Bruce. At the State Department, how do you coordinate? I mean, so you're working on, on the sports side and then you have the foreign policy makers. Uh, is there coordination? Do you? Uh, how, how do you how do you get that uh, dilemma? I was, I was going to punt the question entirely to Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, we do have an internal strategy. It doesn't always look that way, but I promise there is one. <laughs> um, we we work with um, really the experts. There's there's desk officers that focused on one country. There's regional bureau officers that focus on one region, and then there's functional officers that are experts in different topics and themes. So we're a massive um, bureaucracy, of course, but we turn to our colleagues who are the subject matter experts on a region or on an issue really to, to, to craft our um, programming. We work with the Office of Global Women's Issues on the Empowering Women and Girls Through Sports Initiative. We work with the Office of International Organizations on anything related to the UN and Olympic Truce, UNESCO and sports, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor on um, the mega sporting events and human rights issues, and then all of the regional bureaus. Uh, we have divided the world into these different regions for organizational purposes. So yes, and then of course the, the White House and the policy and the priorities, um, our greening of sports initiatives um, received a boost of um, recent support and love, if you can imagine. So it's on the up and up. Uh, mm -hmm. So the White House's um, priorities and the Secretary of State's priorities, it, it all feeds into our broader strategy. But at the end of the day for us, no matter what politics may be out there, no matter what administration, our office, we really focus, we keep our eye on the prize to promote democratic values of um, respect for all and inclusion and, um, and respect for diversity and using sports really is the way to show that. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, the good thing is that sports is always a positive glue uh, chemistry that brings people together, regardless of political uh, disputes among nations. So that's one common feature of every citizen from any country. Bruce, uh, what are your thoughts about this relationship between uh, sports and uh, foreign policy? Uh, I will answer that in one moment, but before I forget, those, I see a Q&A item. Please don't forget to mention that the Maglite was invented by a Croatian, which is certainly true. Uh, Tony Maglica was actually, as a two-year-old, went to New York with his parents and in the early period of the depression, but he was then, they went back to Croatia where he spent his youth 
Um, and when he was a young man, 2021, he came to the US, formed a company, Mag Inc., that created the Mag Light flashlights. So his contribution to Lillehammer during the Bosnian War was certainly uh, moving for him and a, a key part of his heritage. But he also, Tony Maglicia is still alive. He's 93 and he's still running the company and he donates at his own cost. There's no advertising aspect. He donates flashlights to uh, law enforcement, to public safety for the 9-11 cleanup activity and for ceremonial things, including uh, the points of light ceremony that one of the presidents did. So getting back to the, the question about sports and diplomacy, one, one example is early, historically, 1936, the Jesse Owens story, and one of the reasons undoubtedly that he's shown as one of the inspirations for the State Department's uh, sports diplomacy is that during the run-up to the games, the games were awarded to Berlin in 1936, two years before the Nazi party came to power. And so at the time, nobody really knew how bad it was going to get, but there was a lot of debate in the US about holding the games in Berlin or actually supporting the games. But Jesse Owens, as a black athlete in the US, had not grown up with very much privilege and he wasn't about to give up his opportunity to shine on the global stage. And so he certainly did shine. He set four world records at the games in 1936 and kind of uh, was a, a thumb in the nose for Hitler's Aryan and anti-Semitic games, which was really what Hitler was promoting during the games. So that was a kind of a bottoms up uh, use of sports diplomacy to influence global opinion. Excellent. Uh there's a there's an interesting question from one of our uh, good friends, Jorge Fernandez, who is saying, "What about the increase in role of esports, uh, esports globally, both from the point of view of the events themselves, but also as an industry? And are we looking at uh, the role of esports in global diplomacy efforts?" That's a great question. So we established an, an esports initiative um, several years ago, and then when when COVID happened and everything was online, we think, gosh, you know, we did this. This is now the name of the game um, to a certain degree. Um, so it it is a space that we are involved in um, in, in a variety of ways. We did um, in person program in China with um, NBA Two K that sent um, uh, esports stars to, to China for programming. And it was in tandem with a, a traditional basketball program. So it was the eSports basketball, NBA 2K, um, and the, the, the actual eSports expert, as well as a, um, a basketball player. And it was very well received. And this is China. And this is you know two and a half years ago. So um, we turned to our embassies really to help set up kind of the technology where we can engage with um, the eSports community. Because there really is a strong um, a, a, a strong community out there that's that's um, very interested in, um, in in all of the different kind of uh, virtual sporting um, convenings and whatnot. It's also a place where radicalization happens. So we do want to, to be there. Um, so that's through a different bureau. We're also tracking esports, but it's really important and um, in an ever evolving and changing space. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's uh, other questions as well. Uh, uh, Leanne, you may want to ask some additional ones. And then uh, we have only about five minutes, so we're going to ask uh, both Bruce and uh, Trina for some final comments. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of praise, actually, uh, a lot of praise uh, for, for what you both have offered. Go ahead, Leanne. Um, there's a question about how do you measure the impact and success of sports diplomacy. I almost want to pivot to, I don't know if Dr. Sarah Hillier is, is the, the University of Tennessee Center for Sport, Peace and Society rep on the call, but um, we, um, we measure it um, 
through through surveying and through reporting back um, from our our embassies and consulates, we look at what we've done yeah. over you know one year, two year, three year, four year, up to ten years. Um, we have a monitoring and evaluation office um, within the State Department. We have evidence of effectiveness. We have um, uh, anecdotal and uh, we have yeah. So we have both quantitative and qualitative surveying, follow on, and um, and tracking. Um, from a variety of angles, but in our very kind of microcosmic space, our sports diplomacy division works with our cooperative grant partners like the University of Tennessee, like FHI 360, to really do the, um, the, the daily, monthly, and yearly surveying and tracking as it relates directly to our programs. What worked, what didn't. Um, so I hope that helps, it's really important especially in the soft power space to have, um, to justify our budget, to justify our existence and to make sure that we really are achieving the sustain sustainable change that we seek. Excellent. Bruce, do you wanna add anything? Uh, I think Trina captured all of it. Yeah, we'll um, ask, uh, yeah. We'll ask for some final thoughts. Uh, Leanne, unless you have another question for our um, distinguished speakers. Yeah, maybe uh, Bruce, you can you can start with uh, some brief comments about the business and government partnership from IBM perspective, and maybe Trina also have some ideas. Well, I think the the Olympic sponsorship for IBM actually began in 1960 or earlier in Rome. So IBM was a sponsor of the games for many years, actually ended its sponsorship with the 2000 games in Sydney. Uh, and I think for IBM and for any big company, the opportunity to take uh, high-end customers to the games is one of the major benefits and to actually showcase the relationships and the technology that the company has with the organizers of the games. It's important to remember that the organizers, it's always a new team. There's no, other than with the Olympic gypsies who follow the games from games to games and organizing committee to organizing committee, there has not been a handbook of here's how you stage the games. So a lot of the technology and uh, the people that do have some experience tend to gravitate to supporting the games in, in future cities, which is one of the reasons that my team supported both the Winter Games in 94 and the Summer Games in 96, because a lot of the characteristics of sport and therefore the technology underpinning it is similar. You have time, time sports, judge sports, team sports as typically. So a lot of the experience we gained by participating in the winter actually helped them in the summer as well. Excellent. Maybe we'll wrap up with one, one quick question, uh, Trina. Uh, one of our uh, participants is asking, is there an association organization for exchange of experiences and, and activities among professionals like you, global uh, sports diplomacy professionals like you? Uh, is there an international organization where you uh, get together and uh, whether they are in sports or culture departments or like your group in the State Department, uh, do you uh, cross fertilize across nations? All right, that's a great question. And, um, and it, I think it's happened more organically just based on the events that we go to, we gravitate to uh, you know, players in this space. Um, there is Sport in Dev, which is this kind of convener platform, kind of a global Atlanta of sports diplomacy, so to speak. Um, and, and there's different profiles and highlights, and there's a lot of crossover in the community there. So Sport and Dev is one place that's, that kind of convenes the Sport for Social Change players, whatever country or um, our field we, we may be um, focused on. Um, DC has its own little sport and development happy hour club, um, but we've seen at different events, there's, there's a lot of the same faces and players um, and um, knowledge sharing that takes place in a variety of ways, lots of events, 
there's Beyond Sports, there's Boreas, um, uh, USA. So there's some bigger NGOs that serve kind of as these conveners, but it's a great point. And it's very important to, to share knowledge and to swap best practices in the field so that you can tailor it for your respective cultural context or whatnot. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Our time is unfortunately up, but I want to give our, uh, express our sincere appreciation to you both, Bruce Taylor and Trina Bolton for enlightening us, I mean, broadening our horizons and talking about something that we have really not discussed uh, in the past. So you have certainly educated us, opened some new horizons for us. So thank you so much.